lit today is a decentralized key pair. It's a key. It always comes down to the key. Okay, so it's unlockable content Web3 version of Dropbox. Exactly. What is the product today and how it actually works? Hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of keys. Hi everyone, I'm Yura Lifshitz, uh, founder and CEO of SuperDAO. And today we're gonna talk about data ownership, data portability, token-gated content in Web3, how people own the content, uh, how people uh, get access to content, how you can move content from the app to the app, and what kind of tools and infrastructure are needed to make that future happen, and why this future is important and different from what we've seen in Web2, what kind of new business models it enables, and overall, how it shifts the balance uh, from like big tech corporations to users and how it builds like more fair future. Today, our guest is uh, David Snyder from Lead Protocol. That's one of the key infrastructure behind this movement. And so excited to learn from David and his company today. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. So let's start with your background, your company. How long have been Lead Protocol around? Uh, what have you done before? So by way of background, building startups in the end of 2013 and then had a startup that was acquired by LinkedIn, that, that same one that got started in 2013 in, as a SaaS company right at the end of 2017. During that time period, pretty early on, I read the Ethereum white paper, and after some discussions with some friends about it, it really started to click for me and the notion of being able to create programmable money, the implications of DAOs and internet corporations. And so I started working with my co-founder, Chris Cassano, uh, the inventor of one of the first Bitcoin hardware wallets back in 2013. He and I kind of navigated the idea maze, which is this interesting concept in about two years ago. It was almost a feeling that there's there's got to be something more to NFTs than just as collectibles. Uh, you know, we're like, yep. this is our, our kind of prompt was this is the, the Internet after all. Um, everything is dynamic. Chris, on our on our daily call, showed me the first implementation that I had seen of an HTML NFT. This was on a marketplace called Hit at Nook or Hen uh, on the Tezos blockchain. And so it was this NFT. It had slider bars that you could move around and, and that changed the audio associated with them. We, we, we stopped thinking about NFTs necessarily as like picture frames and started thinking about them as something that was dynamic on the web, kind of akin to a browser window. How can we make this kind of uh, platformless browser window, which was this new conception of an NFT that we were having, how can we make this something that is unlockable or gated in a cryptographically secure and decentralized way, kind of meeting the ethos of the space of building systems that are meant to survive and thrive in deeply adversarial environments? What if we take a cryptographic secret, aka a private key, aka an ecliptic curve, have that custodied across a set of nodes? As soon as that kind of insight emerged, then it was very, very clear that we were onto something that the capacity of it extended far beyond just being able to unlock an NFT in this kind of notion of being a decentralized root key for the web at large. Okay, so it's unlockable content. So you need to have a kind of an NFT key or a token. So if you have a token or if you have an NFT, then you can see the content. So what were the next steps? So like, what is the product today and how it actually works? The way that kind of like access control works on the web today, when you sign in with Google, for example, is generally through web tokens that are verified by, you know, one party creates an issued a token and then sends it to another party, which can verify it. And then that verifying party has some content sitting on some centralized server that it then says, oh, this person's token is valid. Let me show them this video, kind of like how Netflix works or sign in with Google works, so on yep. and so forth. The interesting dynamic about the decentralized web is that the storage solutions in the decentralized web, in order to make them resilient, in order to make them decentralized, are public by default. So I'm talking about systems here like IPFS, Filecoin, Ceramic, yep. Arweave, Tableland, that some of your audience may be familiar with. And so as soon as that dynamic changes, which is to say you have some gated content that is no longer privately held on some server, but is, is functionally stored in public, how do you in turn keep that private? And the answer, of course, is by encrypting it client side, which means like on your computer for the user, taking that scrambled or encrypted data, uploading it to this, this storage network, and then having a decentralized network be able to provision other parties a key to decrypt it or, or access it. 
There's about 100 applications live that have it today and another 100 or so that are implementing. And then there's also been some really interesting traction about the network being able to verify on-chain data, like if somebody owns an NFT or is a member of a given DAO, and then uh, create one of those access tokens or signatures that we were discussing before that a central server can validate. And there, we've also seen the development of some applications that use that capacity. There's like a Shopify app in the Shopify app store that lets merchants select an item in their, in their store and select a token or some other on-chain condition and then set up discounts or access for this merchandise based on on-chain data. Effectively, if I hold a certain NFT and I visit a certain Shopify store, then I get a discount. So do I need to press any buttons on the, on the store? Like at what point when I visit a Shopify store, does it understand that I hold the NFT and therefore I'm eligible for discount? I keep this on my desk. It's a key. It always comes down to the key. This is the uh, most recurring uh, concept in my life. Yep. How the user validates that they own a given token and qualify for the right to decrypt something, the right to access something, the right to get a discount, is they sign a message with their wallet and that message is broadcast to the nodes of the Lit protocol, which will then take their verified identity from that signed message. And for what it's worth, this is the same process that is used when somebody like logs into a DAP, for example. It's on a on the product page, and that is part of the application that the merchant installs. Okay, so I, I kind of click the button, I connect the wallet, sign that I prove my ownership of the special discount given NFT, and then the page refreshes with, with a new price. Uh, right, and then you just add it to your cart from there. And then then I pay with Fiat or like whatever Shopify supports. Exactly. The discounts is a very interesting use case. So you said access to content, do you see it primarily, I don't know, music, film, uh, text, uh, education, what, what are the most common kind of categories? Yeah, today I would say it's Web3 social. A lot of applications that are building on Lens protocol, for example, which is an on Polygon social media protocol for managing things like follows and collecting posts. People are encrypting messages and storing them on IPFS, aka just writing posts, mm -hmm. and then setting a rule that says something like, only my followers can see my posts. So a very similar dynamic to something like Patreon, token-gated chat and messaging, which is a chat thread that can only be re read and written to by a person who meets certain on-chain conditions, such as owning an NFT or being a member of a DAO. We have seen some music projects. We have seen some other creator projects as well, like uh, Creaton, for example. But largely, it's been focused on Web3 content today, I would say. We've seen people take token-gated posts and post them on Facebook. But of course, you know, Facebook still that doesn't have any kind of notion of Web3 login, doesn't have any kind of notion of storing anything on decentralized storage. So it's largely Web3 native social. And where things are going? So what 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 is what is to expect? So you you enable the basic kind of token gating so the NFT holders can lock and lock access secret content and conversations. What's next? Or like what's the next wave of adoption? The nature of lit today is it basically is functioning as one decentralized key pair. And a key pair, as you know, like a wallet, they're kind of synonyms, essentially can do two things. It can sign stuff and it can encrypt stuff. And so right now, for the purpose of access control and encryption, the network is functioning as basically just one key. Now, where we're going with this is having the network being able to create hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of keys and store them in this decentralized way. And this is something that we're calling a programmable key pair. You can think about this as a distributed custody cloud wallet. And the beauty of this, this notion of this, this PKP or programmable key pair, as we call them, is that you can layer in computation and automation. Each one of these keys that is custodied by this decentralized network essentially has a controller. And that controller could be an individual, it could be a DAO, it could be a multi-sig, there's all kinds of things to talk about in terms of who's authorized to control one of these PKPs. And then that controller can also associate rules with that PKP. The beautiful thing about having rules and automation and programmability over a wallet means that there's a whole new world of automation that can be written using this technology. So in DeFi, for example, there's really not 
anywhere that has the notion of like a stop loss order or a limit order for staked tokens. You know, if you have some tokens and they're staked somewhere and you see the price dropping, you have to frantically open your laptop to unstake them and sell them. But if you're controlling one of these PKPs, you could have a rule, aka a program, that says if you see the price of XYZ token dropping more than 5% in a 30 minute period, unstake that token, sell it for USDC on a DEX and send it to my hardware wallet. So it's kind of building blocks of new social networks without the actual social networks. So the, the people can use the building blocks in any kind of combination they like. One of the beautiful kind of things here, right? If we think about the types of keys that somebody has associated with them as an individual, they may have a hardware wallet where they keep the bulk of their assets. They may have a browser wallet where they keep their PFP NFT and maybe a little bit of money. And then what we're also proposing here is this notion of this distributed custody programmable cloud wallet. And perhaps they use that just for their kind of social media interaction. But the really kind of wonderful thing here around having the key pair live in a decentralized network opposed to the user having to save their seed phrase is that we can hook up like normal human being non-Web3 auth methods. Is it fair to say that in some way what you describe is almost like Web3 version of Dropbox where you kind of store your content and your photos and then decide who can see them and who can comment them and... Uh... Exactly, yeah. I would say that to me, that's definitely one of the most exciting applications of decentralizing a key pair, having it kind of live in the cloud in the context of a network. So the key pairs is a crypto technology. And for like a regular user, you don't really need to know how it works, but rather what it enables you to do. And what it enables people to do is it's like creating your own apartment on the blockchain where you store a bunch of stuff and then you have a guest keys for like your friends to crash over and for, I don't know, people who come like what are your plans or something like that. So people who basically need like need to know access for individual sub sub elements of your private kind of residence on the blockchain. Is, mm -hmm. is it a good description? Yeah, I think so. I think access is probably the simplest way to think about it, but it, it's more than that, right? Because it's what it is is actually a platform. A platform can definitely govern access. But um, platforms can also do other types of computation beyond access. You have this apartment, you have this hub, and you're giving somebody the, the keys to it. Those keys can be very specific around what they can read and what they can write and, and, and where they can do those things. Limited in time, limited in what they can access and limited what they can do. You can only read or you can read and comment or you can read, comment and edit. Or if it's a financial data, you can also move that, that part of the money or... I don't know if it's a number, you might increase it, but not decrease it. I don't know, something like that. Totally. And it's it's worth kind of mentioning that writing data, that's all that is, is typically happening when you're sending a transaction on the blockchain, right? So like to send a transaction on the blockchain is to write data to the chain. So whether you're writing data to the chain or writing a comment on somebody's post, those are functionally the same thing from the perspective of the key pair. Maybe to conclude, yeah. to conclude, where do you see philosophical difference between Web 2 and Web 3 regarding to data ownership? And what makes you excited about the Web 3 approach? The classic idea of like Ray Kurzweil and the, the, the technology singularity is that human beings have a hard time appreciating the notion of exponential curves. Mm -hmm. And there are some really wild network effect dynamics around a user owned data internet. And maybe it'll take a long time to get really in the business of predicting, just kind of working on some of this infrastructure. But, you know, let's say it takes a couple years for there to be 300 really, really good applications that are kind of living by this principle of giving the user data, enabling interoperability. But then I think, you know, once there's a couple hundred, then very quickly thereafter, there'll be a couple thousand and 10,000. And when we, as the Web3 space collectively hit the bend in the knee of the curve, so to speak, it'll be just like, whoa, where did that come from? And we'll look back at this podcast and be like, 
oh yeah, they've been working on this stuff for a while. But when it hits, so to speak, as it relates to the network effects for the user-owned internet, which includes things like user-owned social media, it'll happen fast. And I think some of the Web2 incumbents will be potentially kind of caught with their pants down when that moment emerges. What needs to happen so that we can hit this exponential adoption moment? I think a lot of the infrastructure isn't quite ready yet, right? To like hit massive scale. Like there's a lot of systems that make up this architecture. Web3 is still a tiny thing. A lot of these systems are untested. We're obviously continuing to do research and development. A lot of our friends and partners in the D-Web ecosystem are continuing to do uh, research and development. So I really think we are very much in a let's harden the infrastructure phase and let's increase the capacity of the infrastructure phase. Um, and that is is one of the big unlocks for this. I would say culturally that, you know, the world is ready, right? Like you look at the work of Tristan Harris and the social dilemma and Francis Haugen, who is the Facebook whistleblower. There's definitely a mood out there that something is not right. It's just that uh, the new system is still kind of in the oven, so to speak. Sounds good. Yeah, I can't wait for, for Lead Protocol and all the partners to make this uh, future reality. It will be not one company, but rather many companies, many building blocks, more freedom, more variety and diversity of experiences and rules, and uh, hopefully less censorship and uh, more freedom of expression. Well, hopefully there will be also uh, you know solutions for like limiting the harmful speech and things like that. I just want to comment to that. Like, I think you've laid that out perfectly. There's a lot to build. Standards, interfaces, connectors, the whole notion of using open systems, like it begets diversity. And then having sophisticated thinkers and builders in terms of like, how do you wrangle that in the context of making something that is really easy for developers to jump into? Because to me, that's one of the reasons that I think Web3 will actually win fundamentally, which is a point that you brought up earlier, which is if you're using Web3 infrastructure, you're paying tokens, you're not managing a cloud, you don't have to worry about running out of memory, you have these systems that you can depend on. And so ultimately, there's this kind of like serverless story around Web3 that I think when we get there, and it be becomes easier to build on Web3 than it does to build on Web2, which we will collectively get there as an industry, I'm, I'm sure. That's, I think, to your earlier question, one of the unlocks as well. Uh, this is great. Uh, thanks, David, for stopping by. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. These have been uh, DAO Heroes, a channel for people who are excited about Web3, the future we're building together, and all the positive changes it can bring to the world. Please subscribe for more episodes like this one. Thank you. And until the next one.